get out of this. So we did that. Um, here's what I'm going to do. What we can also do, and I'm going to play around with this. So we've sorted by day and cell type, right? I want to see what these, say, 30 top genes, most significant genes that change due to day and cell type, what they're doing in my sample. So I'm going to make a heat map. Anybody heard of a heat map before? Yeah, I hate heat maps, but everybody wants them. <laughs> I swear, like three weeks before all the grants are due, I get like eight requests for heat maps. Hey, Mike, can you make a heat map? Yeah, sure. A heat map basically will, will, you know, you can make it say anything you want, and that's kind of why I hate it. Sometimes you can make a very informative heat map. I think we can do a pretty good job with this. So, again, I have my genes. What I want to do is I want to filter this to the top 30. So put your cursor on number one, go down to 30, hit shift, and then you'll select all those. Now right click and go filter include. Again, we can exclude those. We, and we're not, we didn't delete it. That's the cool thing about Partech is I can hide that stuff. I can do statistics just with this and then I can unfilter and then all my data comes back. If you didn't hit delete and I've done that before and cried. <laughs> no, I meant to filter. Here's what we're gonna do is, so these are the genes that we feel change due to both differentiation state and this different cell type. I wanna see it in this data set, but I want to, again, we have 35,000. What I wanna do is I wanna limit this data set just to the list that I produced in the ANOVA. So select your, your study. Go, let's see. What am I doing here? Oh, filter, columns, because that's where your genes are. I'm going to say filter columns based on a list. Everybody see that? Everybody got to that menu? Okay. The key column here is probe set ID. They all have the probe set ID, and if you looked at the columns, that's where, you know, that's what it is. So I'm going to hit, okay, I'm filtering based on my ANOVA I just did, and my key column is probe set ID, which is true. Then I hit okay. You'll notice now you see 39 columns of data. And you'll see like maybe a little yellow thing here. That's how much data you have of your original, your, your original spreadsheet. If I took half of it, there'd be a yellow line like to here in the middle. Okay, so now basically I've got nine columns worth of like sample information, then I also have my data. Here's how you make a heat map, or at least this is how I do it. Go to, so now that we've got it filtered and we just want to look at the, the expression of just those genes, go to tools. Okay, and you can see all kinds of stuff here. Actually, now that I'm teaching, you know, people Partech, I've been playing around with this. A lot of these, I didn't even have any idea what they did. I was like, oh, man, that's cool. I wish I'd have done that on my last study. Okay, under Discover, hit Hierarchical Clustering. So what we are doing is we're basically going to group genes based on similar expression profiles or samples based on, we're going to, group genes on similar expression profiles, which are on our columns. And we're also going to group our samples based on ex similar gene expression. And that'll be our rows. Um, we're just using Euclidean uh, distance to determine how related and how different uh, two samples and two genes are. Uh, average linkage, usually I just leave the uh, defaults the way they are. Now hit OK. Yeah, this is the bread and butter of uh, <laughs> genomic research. Everybody has a, has a uh, heat map they got to show. I don't like looking at 
our different things on, on this side, here's what I want you to do is instead go to transports rows and columns and hit apply. Anybody know what the scale is here? The negative, any guesses? Negative 2 to positive 2.3. No idea. That's standard deviation. So here is why we can, obviously a lot of those genes are expressed at different levels. We are, basically they kind of show up here kind of the same because what we're doing is we're normalizing to the mean. So we take the mean, we basically divide all these genes by its mean expression. And then we standardize the standard deviation to be one for each gene. Does that make sense? Okay. So that the more yellow the color is, the higher the expression. Or the higher above it, it is the mean of all of the samples. Okay. The more blue it is, the lower it is compared to the mean of all samples. So you can think of yellow as an increase and blue as a decrease. You can see these genes and actually what we can do, I know I'm kind of scrunched here, but let me try this. Can you get to your, let's see, I want row. Go to row. Uh, wait, let me see, column. No, I want row. Show gene symbols. Now here's a problem. I think it's trying to do it at the wrong angle. Go zero for text angle. Now hit apply. There they are. Did that work for everybody? For text size, you did 14, and text angle, you put zero. And show gene symbols. Okay, let me take a look. Look how this is, but look how it's divided, right? All the day fives are together. These are the differentiated cells. These genes are really high, but then once you go to undifferentiated, you get a lower expression, except in the red. What's red? ES cells. You can look at some of these, you know, honestly, you could just visually like see some of this and go, what the heck is this going on here? You know, it's missing in this cell type, but obviously it's all good here. And then here you can see all these cells are very high before they get differentiated. And then once they get differentiated, then you see a decrease in their expression. I would imagine, and I kind of looked at some of these genes, and if you look at enough genes enough time, they become your buddies and you kind of know their attitudes. <laughs> some of these I know are, you know, differentiate, you know, these are kind of these, you know, embryonic type genes. And what's happened is you're shutting these down now. This cell is, is now going to be an endoderm. It doesn't need these genes on. It doesn't want these genes on, so it's shutting them down. And what's nice is they seem to be consistent with all these samples. But here, we got a little difference. Again, it's the red that we are concerned with. The red versus all these other ones. And you can see why I grouped the pluripotent stem cells, the different, uh, different clones together, because really it's just kind of sorting them basically the same. Right? They're kind of all over the place. Now when we start sorting them up here, when they get differentiated, that's when they start differentiating their different clones. Any questions on this? And again, you can, you can manipulate this in a lot of different ways. I could put the titles up here. I can add, you know, whatever I want. I could go column. You know, instead of just source name, say I want to, so I'm under columns. I can go new annotation. I could put in day. But apply, so then you'll have the day here. So purple would be day five, blue would be um, 
before they get differentiated. You can change the colors on that if you want. I would say the most important, one of the key skills of being a good bioinformatician is being able to display the data in a way that people can understand it. Yeah? The longer the, the line, the more different they are. So these are very similar. You can see the connecting lines are very small. And actually, I think this is the Euclidean difference, distance here, kind of. The farther away it is, the more distance. So these sam this sample is a little different than all these. You can see that these are way different than everything else. You can see the distance here connecting all. I mean, these are the, the relatedness of these samples. Yep. And you can see that it's grouping genes that have similar expression profiles, right? All of these genes are very similar, or at least kind of similar. Therefore, the software said, oh, it grouped them together. Now we're starting to get, you know, a little different up here. Like, these genes all seem to look alike. And again, I can just, not only can I just see the, you know, the hierarchical clustering, but I can just look at it and go, oh, there's a group, there's a group, you know? This is a group. This is definitely a group here. I don't know what's going on here, but this is something. These two genes, Meg and I bet they're working together. A lot of times what will happen is it will cluster these genes, and what you find out is they actually work together to do a process. What I'm going to show you, too, is after we do, you know, do our statistics, I'm going to show you how you can use correlations to find genes that are related to other genes. And that's like the really cool thing. So if I cluster, if I do a Pearson clustering on, say, my MEG3, I'm going to find genes that have similar expression profiles, basically like this, over the entire data set. I'll pull up a list of genes, and then when I start looking at it, I'll find that they're all related. Here's what I want you to get kind of, you know, keep in the back of your mind is this is all spider webs. Don't picture this as like, you know, little pipelines into, you know, it's not A to B to C. They're all interrelated. And a lot of times when you grab one thing, you grab a bunch of related stuff. You pull on that web, and it pulls everything that's close to it. All right. So let's get out of here. So that's how you make a heat map. Hierarchical clustering heat map.